my book, Fusion, How Integrating Brand and Culture Powers the World's Greatest Companies, talks about the need to integrate and align your external brand identity and your internal organizational culture. I'm a curate event designer, and in this episode, I interview Denise Leon, and we talk about the importance of integrating brand and culture. And Denise is, is the author and of the bestseller What Great Brands Do, and her new book, bu- uh, book Fusion: How Integrating Brand and Culture Powers the World's Greatest Companies. And uh, this is the book that we are going to talk about today. And Denise is also an in-demand keynote speaker, and she has appeared on CNBC, Fox Business, and Wall Street Journal discussing business and branding issues. And uh, she's been helping companies of all sizes and types accelerate their growth by building strong brands for more than 25 years. And uh, so she served uh, as lead strategist at advertising agencies for big brands like Sony, Opry, uh, Burger King, Land Rover, Unilever, and many others. And now Denise is a leading uh, authority on positioning exceptional brands and building great organizations. Hello, Denise. Uh, Thank you so much for taking time to uh, join us on our podcast. Thank you, Arik. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Uh, Thank you. Uh, So in your latest book, uh, Fusion, you argue that uh, savvy business leaders uh, power their company's performance by fusing together their brand and their culture. But before we talk about how to actually, uh, what's the concept behind it and how, how to go about fusing brand and culture, let's just get on the same page can you elaborate, can you explain to our listeners, how, how do you define brand, a brand versus a culture? Sure. You know, I think it's great to kind of start at the beginning. <laughs> so um, when I refer to brand in this context, I'm talking about your external brand identity. So how your organization is understood or perceived by customers and other external stakeholders. And then when I say culture, I'm talking about your internal organizational culture, the way that your people, the people in your organization behave and the attitudes and beliefs that inform them. Some people call their culture the way we do things around here. And that's a pretty good description. So my book, Fusion, How Integrating Brand and Culture Powers the World's Greatest Companies, talks about the need to integrate and align your external brand identity and your internal organizational culture. Right. So, uh, so, uh, so you define brand and brand identity as basically the same thing, right? It's the perception, is how you see the uh, the uh, the, uh, the service or a product uh, and the experience you have with a service or or, or a product externally. Well, um, Arik, you have to understand, like I said, in this context, because uh, most of my brand building work um, is centered around the idea that your brand is not you know, your name or your logo or your image. It's really what you do and how you do it. Um, and so actually, um, you're, like in my, nor- in my regular brand building work, your brand and your culture really are almost like one and the same. But for the purposes of the book and really helping people understand how these two things um, should be related, I felt it was important to specify that when I say brand in this context, I mean your external identity and culture, your internal organizational culture. So um, it's kind of, it's maybe a little bit nuanced and we don't need to get into the weeds, but I just wanted to make it clear that um, it's in this context that I'm talking about your brand as how your organization is understood or perceived by outsiders. Sure. Yeah, that, that definitely makes it clear. So basically, culture is uh, uh, refers to uh, to the internal culture uh, and 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 the beliefs and attitudes that uh, staff employees have uh, internally about the organization, about the company, about what they do, and uh, identity brand to brand uh, as a brand. Uh, you, you mean identity, so how, how you perceive that brand externally by customers, right? Who, uh, uh, who engage with that brand. Yes. Uh, okay, so that's clear. Um, so uh, can we now talk about more uh, about uh, the benefits of, of fusing uh, co- uh, uh, 
culture and brand because that's uh, that's the essence of your book right um you, you you're saying that uh by fusing together uh internal culture and external brand you can build uh better performing uh brands stronger brands that have uh that reduce like have reduced turnover and and they have uh, better customer satisfa satisfaction and 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 they can just grow faster in general and and uh, gain competitive advantage exactly yeah so i mean you you've covered a lot of important points there arik um, when you fuse your external brand identity and your internal organizational culture you get internal benefits in the sense that you have increased employee engagement because you're able to attract and retain people who are motivated by your purpose and everyone who works in your organization, organization is committed to that contribution that you want to make. You also get greater workforce alignment because um, you know, people aren't wasting time trying to figure out what is the right thing to do or working at cross purposes. You also get external benefits in the sense that you increase your competitive advantage because when you are fusing your your culture and your brand, you're really producing intangible value for your customers and your employees that your competitors can't copy or it's very difficult for them to copy. So you have a more sustainable competitive advantage. And probably most importantly, you pass the customer test of brand authenticity. By aligning and integrating your culture and your brand, you truly are on the inside what you say you are on the outside, and that is more important now than ever before for customers. Sure, and in your book, you also give a lot of, a ton of examples, actually, which I really like, and because you talk about some of the most famous brands that we can all relate to, and so we can understand the concept. I think that this is really the key to, uh, to, uh, to talk about, I, I know that you reverse engineer some of uh, their greatness uh, by interviewing um, uh, business leaders and analyzing this, what they've done right or what they've done wrong and why they are successful or why they are unsuccessful uh, through, the, through brand and culture fusion. And one of those examples you mentioned is Amazon. So can we talk a bit more about that? I think it's a great example and, and it's going to help our listeners understand what what that brand and culture fusion is all about. Sure, and Amazon is a great example and a very interesting one because you know when I wrote the book, it was before the pandemic and COVID and and all the issues that Amazon is having now, which we can talk about in just a moment. Um, but yeah. let me first explain that the reason why I wrote about Amazon is because they are notorious for having. Um, an extremely like high performance oriented culture in the sense that you know there was an expose that was written in the New York Times several years ago that you know reported on employees like you know crying at their desk because their managers were berating them for not meeting their the, uh, working to the standards or meeting their goals and people suffering incredible stress and um, I think you know a lot of people read that expose and and thought well gosh Amazon's culture just sounds very toxic and and you know, people call the CEO Jeff Bezos a workplace bully, basically. Mm -hmm. But yeah. what what I think is fascinating about that is that there were a lot of folks, and and me included, who actually thought that the culture at Amazon sounded exciting and challenging and inspiring. And you know, certainly we we don't want to be suffering stress and crying at our desks, but we do want to be you know, to have big goals and to be pushed to achieve them and to, um, you know, work with confidence and, and um, that kind of um, stick to -itiveness. And so um, I point to Amazon because this culture is also kind of what makes their brand. You know, the fact that they are so um, obsessed with customers and obsessed with performance is exactly why customers you know, love Amazon. You know, um, we, I think as customers have been um, trained by Amazon to expect to get what we want, when we want, where we want it, how we want it. And so exactly. there's really no disconnect between this hard driving culture within the organization and this like great performing brand outside of the organization. The two are really very mutually enforcing and, and um, interdependent. 
And so that's why they're a great example of the power that can be created with brand culture fusion. Now, at other organizations, that kind of culture could completely backfire. It could not, it could be inappropriate for the kind of brand that the company aspires to. But that's exactly the point. Every organization is different. And so their culture should be different, just like their brand is different. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, definitely. So, so basically, uh, just to sum up, uh, the, uh, the uh, Amazon's culture was described in, in this article, in this New York Times article, as, as brutal and harsh, but somehow it works. So uh, what you are trying to, I, I think you are trying to make a point here that your culture doesn't have to be friendly and fuzzy and warm in order to work uh, because every company is different. As you mentioned, every organization is different and it works for Amazon. So this type of culture works for Amazon and and actually if you achieve this uh, alignment of brand and culture and it works for your organization, uh, then uh, you know, some, some employees actually report that they, they are thrilled to work in this kind of, uh, uh, w- in this kind of company because uh, they, they, are, uh, they feel that purpose. They feel, they feel that, they are, uh, that why behind their work, why they, uh, it's fast paced. It's uh, they maybe stressed out, but it push it, it, it kind of pushes them to um, to to just do a great job and and uh, everything is about one singular focus uh, to, to about one thing: excellence on on the behalf of the customer, right? So um, right. now, what I think, as I said, what's interesting about Amazon is that in the recent months. Um, you know, what has happened during the pandemic is that um, Amazon has come under a lot of criticism, um, especially by employees who felt like they were not providing a safe workplace and following, you know, appropriate health and safety procedures. And um, so, you know, there, um, I think, and particularly it's in their warehouses where this was happening. And, um, I think that it's raised an interesting or um, an important question for customers of Amazon are, you know, as a customer of Amazon, are you willing to support an organization, you know, with your dollars, you know, with your purchases, are you willing to support a company that maybe doesn't take care of their employees as they should, or at least doesn't appear to be. And so, you know, um, at some point you have to add, like the brand and culture alignment am- at Amazon, um, you know, f- for many years has been a strength, but perhaps it's, it's become um, a, a question point or even a, a point of criticism for some folks. Right. Uh, so, uh, so now let's talk about, uh, so, so you, in, your, in your book, you will say that every organization is fusion, uh, regardless of what is, uh, whether it is a, a big organization, a huge organization like Amazon, or uh, it's a small startup, and regardless of whether, whether it is uh, B2B or B2C, and you, and, and you list some of the things like, especially when, when uh, you're outperformed in your category or your brand value is declining, or you have a high turnover or low recruitment success, or you're just, uh, uh, just employee and or customer service shows you a lot of room of improvement. Uh, so would you, would you agree that these are the like key, uh, uh, key factors that uh, you, you should consider wh- wh- when thinking about uh, aligning your brand and culture? Well, Ark, what you've just described are problems that companies find themselves in. And certainly brand culture fusion, cultivating brand culture fusion can help get you out of those problems. But I would suggest that you want to avoid those problems in the first place. And the way to do that is to ensure that you have this integration and alignment of your brand and your culture from the very beginning and throughout everything that you do so that you don't fall into these situations where you you have competitive threats or you're experiencing sort of crisis. And so that's why I say that fusion really is a, is an approach that makes sense for all types of organizations. And I, and I would say, you know, um, that startups um, probably have the best advantage 
in terms of getting started with brand culture fusion? You know, when you are just starting and you are, um, you know, it's just you and some of your partners and you have this great idea. And, you know, uh, I think many entrepreneurs these days have a sense of really wanting to make an impact on the world. That is the time yeah. to codify what you believe, um, what you want to stand for and how you want to run your company. And then as you scale, um, both in terms of numbers of employees and then hopefully also revenues and growth, you continue to cultivate that integration of brand and culture. So like I said, that then you know, hopefully you avoid a lot of the problems that companies that didn't start off that way end up experiencing. Right. So it's about avoiding those problems. When you run into those problems, that's, uh, that's an indicator that you should really think about it. But it, you're just uh, really, uh, you would really encourage uh, young entrepreneurs and startups to really think about at the early stage of their business, uh, about, uh, about their culture and about their purpose, core values and integrating culture and, and brand at the early stage in order to avoid those problems, right? Right. Okay, sounds good. So uh, now let's talk about, uh, because uh, uh, you mentioned uh, culture uh, and culture uh, and in key components of, of building a great, uh, a, co- a company's culture is to define, to first define its um, one overreaching purpose uh, and then uh, core values, right? So let's start with, uh, can, you, uh, can you just walk us through your process of discovering uh, company's purpose and why, and, and, and I know you also uh, mentioned this in the book that many, many brands have different statements, purpose, vision, uh, mission, uh, positioning, vibe proposition and so on, but you would, rather, uh, you would rather stick to one single overreaching brand purpose uh, so it's clear to everyone in the organization uh, and, and other statements, they just add to confusion. Correct. Do, do I understand I well? Wrote, yeah. uh, I just wrote a uh, Forbes article about this because you're right. Oftentimes companies will have, uh, let's say, a mission statement for their business And then they will also have a separate brand strategy or brand essence for their brand. And then they might also have other statements or, you know, other rallying cries for the organization. And what happens is that your employees get really confused about which is really your priority. So, you know, if your mission statement says, you know, we want to build shareholder value by delivering products and services in innovative, cost-effective ways but you want your brand to stand for, you know, fun and, um, you know, engagement and, and imagination and discovery, whatever, you know, those are, those are both great ideas, but they really don't have anything to do with each other. And so you want to make sure that you have a single overarching purpose, a purpose that speaks to how you want to engage all stakeholders from customers to employees to all the other stake, stakeholder groups as well. Right, and, and here you mentioned uh, Nike as an example. So uh, I just want to give uh, to, to our listeners a few examples uh, so, so that we can just understand or even remember that and, and then just, uh, you know, when we, when we think about that, we have a point of reference. So, uh, so you mentioned this uh, about uh, Phil Knight, uh, the founder of Nike and, and, the, and, the, and Nike's brand purpose and how he... Uh, discovered uh, this purpose. Can you uh, talk about that a little bit? Sure. Well, you know, I, I've studied Phil Knight and the story of Nike uh, quite in depth. And, you know, there's a great story about him being this entrepreneur, selling shoes out of his his parents' home. Um, um, but he did it. He got into the business because he truly believed that inspiring people to run and giving them a great shoe to run in would make the world a better place, you know? Um, And so today, Nike's mission reads, you know, they say that they exist to bring inspiration, innovation to every athlete in the world. And if you have a body, you're an athlete. And so it's this idea that has driven everything that Nike's done from Phil Knight's 
early years to what it is today. And when you talk to executives inside the Nike organization, they believe this as much as an organizational value as an external brand identity. Yeah, another good example actually comes from my Sony days. I headed a brand and strategy for Sony Electronics. And um, uh, you know, we, all of our, our, our overarching purpose was inspiring people to dream and find joy. And we meant that for both employees, you know, engineers, as well as salespeople, as well as like, you know, the attorneys that worked on the business to somehow be able to dream and find joy in what they were doing. We also meant it for our customers who would, you know, buy a Sony TV or, you know, a Sony PlayStation or some other device and be able to use that device device to help them dream and find joy. And so it's having this overarching purpose, this one idea that really unifies and aligns everything that you do. Now we are going to take a quick break here, but we will be right back. Listen, my mission is to help people design iconic brands. And let's be honest, there are many brand designers out there, but not so many brand strategists. And after all, if you are a designer, clients come to you for a logo or brand identity, but what they really want is to build a brand. And brand building starts with strategy. So if you want to level up as a creative professional and truly be able to help your clients, then you need to become a brand strategist. You see, you need to engage your clients early on in the process and run a discovery session with them and then develop a brand strategy that will inform all your creative work so that you will be able to charge for thinking, avoid revisions later on and land on the same vision as your clients. And everything that you need to learn how to do that, you can find in my online course at ebekdesign.com for a slash shop, where you can find the worksheets, case studies, video tutorials, and other additional resources. Now let's get back to our conversation with Denise Leon. So now since we, since we know more about brand purpose as the core component of your brand strategy, right? And we, we, we have some examples now, uh, how to go about can you give us some tips on uh, how to actually go about discovering your brand purpose because it, it needs to be succinct it, it needs to be clear and uh sometimes it's difficult uh i know from, from my experience working with uh, mostly startups and small businesses that uh, entrepreneurs want to include everything uh and, but this this purpose should be actually very very concise and on point so can you give us uh, I know that you have five whys that he can you explain on that? Yeah. So first of all, Ark, you said something really important in the sense that, you know, um, your purpose needs to be specific and focused. If you try to be everything to everyone, you usually end up being nothing to no one. And so, you know, you want your purpose to uh, uh, articulate an idea, to identify an idea that provides focus and um, uh, prioritization on what you are doing. Um, so you, you talked about the five whys exercise, and I, um, yeah. I borrowed this from Jim Collins and Jerry Porras, who wrote the book Built to Last. And this exercise is all about getting at your purpose by starting with a very kind of basic description of what, why, what you do, you know, so we make X product or we deliver X right. service. And then you ask why five times. So you ask, why is that important? Why is it important that we make X product? Mm -hmm. And then why is that important? And then why is this your, and then why is that important? So you're kind of unpeeling the layers of the onion to really get at the core purpose. What is really driving like at the very essence of what you're doing? Because in the end of the day, you know, um, most entrepreneurs aren't like their purpose isn't to create an app, for example, it's right. to help people get to where they need to go in a safe and reliable way. And even that as a purpose is more about, you know, enabling people to do what they want to do without all the hassles of, 
of transportation. And even that, you know, if you ask why is that important? Well, it's because we believe that people need to be places to do things to make their dreams come true. And so as you are asking why and as you're unpeeling this onion, you really get to that dent in the universe that Steve Jobs uh, from Apple used to talk about. It's like, what difference do you really want to make in the world? Um, you can also just ask yourselves, you know, what would what would be missing in the world if we didn't exist? And sometimes that helps you identify really what your core purpose is. Again, yes, you know, if you're if you're an app developer, sure, your app wouldn't exist. But why, like, why would that make a difference? What really would be missing? Um, how would people's lives be different if you didn't exist? Okay, so you mentioned two, uh, two uh, so you gave us two, basically two, two techniques, either five wise technique to get to the, the true essence uh, and uh, to, of your purpose. Uh, so starting with a product or service and then asking yourself, why is it important? And then, uh, you know, asking again this question, why does, does your answer matter uh, a few times, uh, five times uh, to get to, to uncover the real thing or another way to go about uh, discovering a uh, company purpose is to uh, just ask yourself, what would be missing if we didn't exist? Right. And, right. and my book also includes other exercises, but it would take me too long to kind of go through those sure. exercises. So at the risk yeah. of sounding like I'm pushing my book, which I'm not, I would just say that, you know, there are lots of ways to get at your purpose and yeah, you will yeah. find several exercises in my, in my book that help you do that. Yeah, definitely. If you, if you want to learn more about, uh, uh, I'm just uh, you should you should definitely check out the book. There is a lot of techniques, a lot a lot of different uh, tips. Uh, so uh, then you really dive uh, dive in into the, into that subject. So we just want to like cover uh, key uh, important things uh, uh, to give you like an overview of, of what's that book about. Um, okay, so so. Uh, Let's say once we have a single over, overarching purpose to, to express the why of your company, why you, why you exist, why does it matter, then uh, we also, what we need to do is we need to uh, define core values and, and express them. And, uh, and here we talk about, and here we give a Google as an example, which, is a, which I think is a great example. And uh, also from my own experience working with, uh, startups uh, uh, and, and you also mentioned that in the book that you know m many uh, business owners make this mistake they just uh, use a single words like authenticity which does not really mean or quality that doesn't mean much to employees and they don't know how to act on that um, how to actually use it so you recommend to actually describe each uh, each core value in your own words, uh, preferably some actionable sentence that's going to allow uh, uh, the staff to actually implement that and use uh, every day on a day-to-day -day basis. Right. Well, there are several things that, that should be said about core values. You know, the first is that just like you need to have a single overarching purpose, you need to have a single set of core values um, that guide and drive everything that you do as a company and as a brand. So again, you don't want to have internal workplace values and then separate external brand values. You really want them to be one and the same so that everything you do is working toward you working under those values. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing I would say is that it's important to differentiate between category values versus core values. Category values are values that all companies in your category need to embrace and just all companies in general need to embrace. So things like integrity or authenticity or ethics or teamwork or respect or all of these things those values are important, but they are not differentiating and they are not truly at the core of what enables you to do or what is going to enable you to do what you want to do. So you want to make sure that your core values speak to the specific ways that you want the people in your organization to act and behave so that they will produce the specific results you're looking for. And then lastly, to your point, for all of your core values, it's 
um, important to not only explain what you mean by those core values, but then also to link behaviors and performance standards to those core values. So you make it very clear, this is what it looks like when we are, when you work by this value, and this is what it um, looks like when you don't, so that people have clarity about uh, the importance of your values and what they really look like. Sure. So, so just to give like, uh, give us some specific examples. So for example, uh, one, one of Google's core values is customer face, a uh, customer focus, and they describe it as focus on the user and all, uh, all, all else will follow. Or quality is described as great isn't just good enough. So, uh, so basically, uh, now uh, the next, uh, so now how to go about uh, articulating your core values. So you, you have this great framework. Um, so we came up with nine brand types, right? Uh, and well, you said nine, the, so um, to explain um, through my you know, 25 plus years of working with brands, what yeah. I found is that there are a discrete number of types of brands. Every, again, every brand is different, but in terms of how a brand competes or how it's positioned relative to its competitors, there are generally nine different ways that the that a brand um, does that and so that's where that's the basis of these nine brand types that i've identified so you have a brand type like um a disruptive brand and a disruptive brand actually challenges the existing ways of doing things in the market and introduces new concepts that substantively change that the market um, you also another brand type is a service brand uh, a service brand routinely delivers high quality customer care and service. Another brand type is luxury. You know, so there are some luxury brands that offer to be a premium quality at a premium price. So there are nine different types of brands. Yeah. And if you know what type of brand you have or that you want, then you can use the assessment tool that I've developed, the brand culture fusion assessment, to help that then points you to the types of values that you need in order to to be able to become that kind of brand. So for example, this disruptive brand that challenges the current way of doing things, well, some of the, the values are going, are, that you're gonna need in order to be able to create that kind of brand, the kind of values you need internally are valuing competition or valuing risk-taking, valuing standing out, uh, valuing curiosity. You know, those are the types of values that will help you get to a disruptive brand. Whereas if you want, if, if you're, you're going after more of a service brand type, then the internal core, internal core values that you want to um, cultivate are things like being caring and developing empathy and expressing humility. So every, so by knowing what kind of brand type you have or you want, you're at least able to get into some direction of how, uh, what kinds of core values you need. Sure. So, so, so just to sum up, so the, the way to identify your, your core values is to first determine your brand type. And we have nine brand types, disruptive, conscious, service, innovative, value, performance, luxury, and style brands. And, uh, and then just use the resources in the book to, uh, to actually uh, to figure out what core values would be appropriate for your brand and just take it from there, right? Well, to explain this, uh, the assessment tool that I developed will help you actually determine your brand type and then will point you to those values. I mean, you certainly, yeah. the book lays out the framework, but I think if you want to um, get the, the um, clearest direction, you're probably best using the tool. And then to your point, once you know, for example, that you need, that you want to have values that are about caring and humility and empathy in order to develop a service brand, then you need to make those values unique. Then you need to make them your own. Um, this, these are just a starting point for you to then flesh out and develop and really capture the specific ways that you want to express humility, for example. Sure, and this is and this is really important, as I remember from the book, because you mentioned that uh, uh, it's it's much better to describe those uh, 
uh, common core values in your own words so that they they just uh, they seem uh, original or authentic and and, uh, and uh, employees can, uh, it can it just doesn't they just don't uh, seem like they're uh, they could be any any company's core values they they, they seem like they're they they feel like they're original, right? So you just recommend to describe, if it's about humility, describe humility in your own words. Well, and again, it's, and, um, and I'm, I'm sure you didn't mean this, Arif, but it's more than just appearing or feeling. It's really about being different as well. And so that's, that's the point I was making earlier about your core values versus your category values. You really want to have you know, core values that are very distinctive so that you get distinctive behaviors and distinctive results. Um, and so one, you know, uh, that's why I really put a lot of emphasis on, you know, now that you know kind of the direction of your core values, really making them your own. Sure. Uh, and a great example you, uh, you give also here just to, just, just to uh, help our listeners understand. So you mentioned, for example, uh, Nike and Apple, as uh, they belong to the same brand type, there, which is innovative, right? But they just they have very diff they target different customers. They don't, don't they don't have much in common, although they they are both innovative brands, right? Correct. Or you know another example is like um, BMW and, and FedEx. They're both very um, high performance brands. But you would never confuse those two because they've really each of those companies has made their core values their own. Yeah, yeah. I have to uh, I have to admit that your your inter, uh, framework is really interesting uh, uh, because I have never came across anything uh, like that. Uh, I, I, you know, I heard about other ways of uh, going about determining your or your core values, but this is really really interesting. I think it's uh, it's much easier. Uh, and uh, it it totally makes sense. So I would love to uh, I would love to use it with my clients. Um, so uh, what would be the next step uh, once we uh, once we are able to uh, define our uh, uh, over overarching brand purpose and then determine uh, the brand type and then uh, describe our core values? What's the next step? of uh, this brand culture fusion. Right, right. Well, the third, so you just talked about the first two chapters of my book. So the third chapter lays out the next step, which really is to accept responsibility for cultivating culture and achieving brand culture fusion. And what I mean by that is oftentimes the leaders of organizations will say that brand and culture are important, but then they end up delegating brand building to their marketing department and culture building to their HR department. And they think, okay, I'm done. I've done my role. I've, you know, I've, I've fulfilled my responsibility. And what, what they don't realize is that brand culture fusion and culture building in general is a strategic leadership responsibility. Um, certainly, you will have different people in your organization execute specific programs or specific changes in order to help achieve those goals, but you as a leader need to, to initiate them, you need to invest in them, and you need to champion them, uh, you know, for your entire organization. And so, um, and, you know, that involves not only, um, you know, talking about culture and talking about brand culture fusion, it also doesn't only mean role modeling your desired, you know, attitudes and behaviors and, and um, kind of pursuing the purpose, but it means actually operating your company differently so that you can cultivate your desired culture. And so the rest of my book lays out five strategies for the way that you can run your company differently in order to achieve brand culture fusion. Sure. Sure. So just, uh, uh, just to sum up, great brands are built from the inside out. So, and, and the power is unleashed from from your culture. So, you should really start uh, looking at your culture, uh, uh, build a strong culture, and then uh, and then treat it as as a as a whole, uh, your your culture and your brand, and and and, and align it in or, so in order to build that build a strong brand. 
Uh, and, and also you mentioned that leaders must take responsibility for that brand culture fusion because it, 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 it comes from the top and it shouldn't be delegated to HR or other departments. Uh, it's re really leaders' responsibility to, uh, f for that brand culture fusion. Yep, that's right. Okay, uh, so now uh, as we are about as we are approaching the end of our podcast, can you uh, give us some? Uh, uh, how can we get in touch with you, and uh, wh where can where can we learn more about you and, and the work you do? Great. Well, Arik, thank you for asking. Um, my website, deniseleyan dot com, is a great way to get in touch with me, to access all of my resources and materials. You can download free chapters from my books. Um, you can sign up for my newsletter. It's really a portal to all things. So I would encourage folks to go to the website and um, explore all, all that is there. Um, and definitely reach out to me uh, via social media. I believe, Ark, that's how you and I connected. Um, so I love meeting new people and um, I just encourage your listeners to reach out to me um, so that we can make connections. Sure, and I will include uh, links in the description box so you guys can check out the book and check out uh, Dennis's website. Uh, and her social media handles. So uh, thank you very much, Denise, for coming on the show. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you, Ark. So this is it for today's episode. And make sure to go and check out Denise's website and follow her on social media. And you can find all the links on this episode's page at epicdesign.com forward slash podcast forward slash seven. So thanks for tuning in. And if you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to my podcast for more tips on branding, strategy and design. This was Arek Dvornichak from Epic Design.